Bé, moment, com dèiem, d'arribar a aquest tercer panell, aquesta tercera taula, avui ho fem amb la taula, en aquest cas, titulada Llibertat Sindical i Justícia, els reptes de treballar a l'electrònica global, on s'analitzaran els reptes a què s'enfronten les persones treballadores de la indústria, accentuades per la Covid-19, en aquesta situació en què ens trobem ara mateix, tot posant l'accent a la llibertat d'associació, al treball forçós i la càrrega viscuda per les dones pel que fa a l'exposició a químics. Ho moderarà Dina Septi, ara mateix establerta a Indonèsia. Dina és actualment la coordinadora regional de Good Electronics, un dels principals col·laboradors d'aquesta sisena edició del Mobile Social Congress. La Dina ha treballat amb el Centre de Recursos Laborals de Sedan a Indonèsia i a aquesta mateixa hora ja dono la paraula perquè pugui presentar ponents i moderar aquesta tercera, que és la tercera d'aquesta primera jornada d'avui. Hello. Hello, Dina. Welcome. Thank you. I, I'm sorry I couldn't hear the uh, English translation, so I was a little bit shocked. <laughs> Hello. Uh, sh shall we uh, start now? Can I start now? Yeah, of course. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Hello, um, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are. My name is uh, Dina Septi. I will be the moderator for this session, and I welcome you all. Uh, maybe you've already been here before me, or uh, we were just uh, everyone who just got arrived here. And this is the day one of the uh, Mobile Social Congress. And in this session, we will be discussing uh, the freedom of association and justice the challenges in the global electronic industry. There will be four speakers uh, in the session. Uh, first, there will be Jeroen Merck from uh, University of Edinburgh and Fami Paninong from Lips, Indonesia. Sorry. And then um, second, there will be Heather White, uh, a documentary filmmaker, research consultant, and also Olaf Bjornsson from Sweatwatch. We will have one hour um do we um is everyone here all okay yes i see Yerun are already here and and fahmi i haven't seen fahmi but maybe he's i'm here dina okay that's great hi fahmi okay um so just like i said before we have one hour and i will i will give um sign if the time will run up for every one of you and i without further ado i will um invite our first speaker uh Jeroen mark from university of uh, edinburgh so Jeroen mark is a labor and human rights expert and hold a phd in international relations from university of sussex brighton his research interests lie at the crossroads of international relations, political economy, social movement, and the governance institutions of global industrial relations. He has published on these topics in peer-reviewed journals and academic books. And I will also um, introduce Fami as well before uh, so Jeroen will present and then followed by uh, Fami afterward. And now Fami is with the was with the Asian uh, Monitor Resource Center Hong Kong and coordinated the Asian PNC Monitoring Network. He also coordinated regional research to support the struggle of Samsung workers across Asia. And Jeroen has just finished his research in Indonesia on freedom of association in the electronic industry. And would you like to share your screen now, Jeroen, or maybe later? Um, and you have 15 minutes, Jeroen, afterward. Uh, Fahmi will follow your presentation, and I will tell you when the time is almost run up. I will just interrupt your presentation later. Okay, the time is yours, Jeroen. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, Dina. Uh, thank you for uh, the organizers as well. 
Um, I have to share my screen. I don't know for one one reason or another I cannot share my screen. Um, just so maybe I should just go ahead without my PowerPoint. Is that okay? I will try share your presentation, Mirun. If I can do that, let me see. Um, Jerome, uh, we will try to share our screen so that you can see the, your slides, okay? Okay, yeah. I can also just start, right? I mean, I could do it without the presentation. Yes, I think so. All right, uh, let me see. So I did uh, a little research together with Harry Nu Groho uh, on freedom of association in the electronics industry in, uh, in Indonesia. Uh, this, this was part of the uh, Make ICT Fair project. Sorry, this is my presentation showing now. Sorry. <laughs> 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 sorry, sorry for that. <laughs> They're all in the same folder. <laughs> it's coming. You can you can speak that on, and we will put your presentation. So uh, this is part of the uh, Make ICT Fair uh, uh, we, uh, program that right? just ended a few months ago, and we did uh, field work in uh, two regions in Indonesia, in Bakasi and in. Uh, which is uh, close to Jakarta, uh, next to Jakarta, and in Batam, which is uh, close to Singapore. And both are very important um, electronic industry hubs, areas. Um, let me see. So the, the, the research is part of a bigger research on, on freedom of association in the electronics industry. And of course, freedom of association is, is known as an uh, enabling right or process right, which would give workers a possibility to improve their own conditions and monitor the, uh, the work, workplace conditions at, at the work floor. And also, let's say, struggle or negotiate for better, better working conditions uh, uh, there. So it's, it's already at the next slide, if you can, uh, yeah. So, uh, but in general, in, in, in electronics, um, very few unions exist uh, in most countries. The union movement is extremely, extremely weak, um, or the state does does uh, basically not allow for free trade unions. Uh, there's there's political repression of trade unions, and there's also a lot of corporate opposition to trade unions. And Indonesia is an interesting case because uh, it's one of the few countries in in production let's say in, in the south where, where the the law allows uh, trade unions to operate so this is pretty different from vietnam or uh, many other countries in that region where where, where where these legal protections are absent um okay um can you go to the next slide please so uh, we did research in Indonesia uh, over the last uh, year 
which was partly interrupted by by uh, COVID-19. That so we had to to um, end or survey in Batam at the time because we that was in March uh, 2019, um, 2020. I'm sorry, uh, but we did our research in in Bakasi and we we had uh, four different uh, factories uh, with different positions in the in the supply chain. So a number of tier one factories that directly supply uh, or uh, as uh, uh, the, the, the mother company or a, a brand. And we had an, uh, tier two companies, which are lower in the supply chain and, and a tier three uh, company, which is basically a component supplier for one of the tier one uh, factories. And we did a survey of 200 uh, people uh, through a snowballing uh, process. And we worked with local unions to get access to the to the workers. And we also did a number of in-depth interviews with, with trade union leaders and, and NGO uh, representatives, activists, academics, ILO people, etc. Uh, next slide, please. So if you look at the electronics industry in uh, in Indonesia, it's 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 as I said already, uh, it's very much focused on on, on Jakarta on the one end, with Bekasi as the most important hub and um, Batam, close to Singapore, as the second important uh, hub. Um, it's, it's basically, Indonesia was quite late with attracting um, el the electronics industry. So, so it was until the mid 1980s, it was basically focused on the domestic market. But then um, the, uh, there was an attempt to attract uh, export uh, more export industries and electronics was one of them in, from the mid 1980s onwards. Um, and, but still, if we, um, and they focused on the labor intensive uh, consumer electronics and also electronic components. Uh, so Indonesia is pretty small if you compare it to uh, other countries in the region. So, so it's it's there are about 360 uh, manufacturers and about 260,000 workers are active in the industry. Um, but this is very small compared to to Vietnam or Malaysia or China, of course. Next slide, please. Can you can you slide on? Yeah. So just uh, I mean. You can see Indonesia is at, at, at a very low level of export when it comes to uh, components and parts as well as uh, finished products. And since 2010, uh, the, the, let's say the export volume has, has, has also gone going down in Indonesia. So the, uh, Indonesia is pretty small, but it is often identified as an, an important electronic site for the future. Um, so, so because it's a very large country with a very young population. So, so you can often see that investors often argue that Indonesia can become very important in the, in the, in the future. Next slide. So we have seen in Indonesia an, 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 an transition 20 years ago from a very authoritarian regime uh, to a more democratic regime. Uh, and under that past regime, there was only one union allowed, um, the SPSI, um, which was um, which is pretty much like, like China or Vietnam today. Um, and after 1998, uh, Indonesia ratified ILO conventions uh, the ILO core conventions, including the, those on, on freedom of association and collective bargaining. So on the, on the, on the one hand, on the, on the reformasi, um, under the new regime, trade unions were allowed and, 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 and emerged very rapidly. Um, next slide, please. Um, and many unions emerged. Um, 
and it was quite a, a still quite an, a, an active trade union movement, but there are also still many barriers to freedom of association, also in the electronics industry, but more widely as well. So, so there is an uh, institutionally uh, trade union rights are still very poorly protected, uh, and 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 there are many violations, and manufacturers or employers can get away with these violations because they are not necessarily afraid for prosecution. There is, there is a kind of, there is officially a democratic regime, but there is also a kind of shadow state of an unofficial network of businessmen, bureaucrats, oligarchies, uh, criminals that, that, that collaborate to, to repress trade unions. Uh, they often use gangs or pre-men uh, to to attack uh, trade unions or I intimidate them, and then there is the role of the old union um, that still plays an important role in in segments of the of the of the trade union movement, and uh, it's not necessarily um, working on behalf of 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 workers. So there is still the old traditional trade union uh, that's that that uh, can be an, an, a huge barrier for uh, sincere unions to operate well within in, in factories. And employers often collaborate with these legacy unions to, uh, to keep other unions out of the, uh, the factory. And next slide, please. Um, so we have seen there is a huge trade union growth in Indonesia. Um, um since uh, since since the fall of Suharto um still only two and a half percent of of Indonesian Indonesians are part of the trade union in electronics of in the industrial area it's 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 a bit higher 70 percent and within electronics it's probably even much more even higher because uh, electronics is, as said before, uh, concentrated in Bakasi and Batam. And here, um, trade unions are very active. The, the metal union is very active. And many more factories are, are unionized. So I don't have precise figures, but it would probably be over 50% of factories that, that have, has, uh, has been unionized in these, in these areas. Uh, so in Batam, for example, the metal union has um, um, uh, has been active in, in 27 factories and has been able to conclude collective bargaining agreements in, in 14 of them. Uh, next slide, please. So, so on the one hand, we can see that, that um, there, is a, there is a kind of uh, change in labor regime from the very authoritarian er era to, an, uh, to a new one uh, that allows for freedom of association, at least on, on paper or, um, but in practice, this is undermined in, 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 in many different uh, ways uh, because of the barriers I mentioned earlier, but also very important is the, the creation of a flexible labor market, um, whereby more and more workers are employed on the, on the temporary uh, working conditions, uh, contracts, and that undermines very much uh, the strength of trade unions in, in Indonesia. Um, Jeroen, sorry to interrupt. You have one minute more. One minute. <laughs> yeah. well, just uh, let's let's go on quickly. Uh, so maybe yeah. Next slide, please. Um, so, so from the, from the survey, we found that um, uh, more or less half of the, the workers are in temporary contracts, often for for uh, for uh, many years, um, and there is a growing growing use of interns, which has also been seen in other countries, uh, but there is also in in Bakasi, you can see there is a growing use of interns that often. Uh, students, but they often uh, work on very poor uh, conditions. Next slide. 
or maybe um, go to the final one. Um, so, so to so basically to conclude, what we found is that 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 uh, Indonesia stands out comparatively quite well compared to other countries that there is there has been a uh, trade union movement uh, that has been quite successful in large mobilizations and also in in union, in in in, in, in um, getting access to unions and and even collective bargaining, which is almost absent in most other countries. But still, uh, the, let's say, market flexibility is, is, is rapidly increasing and makes it more difficult for unions to establish themselves and it's eroding their power. Um, international competition and a neoliberal agenda that is basically um, um, part of the omnibus law on, on job creation that, that will further flexibilize uh, working conditions and employment relations that will most likely further undermine the role of the trade union. And there's much more to say, <laughs> but that will be have to wait for, an, for another occasion. All right? Okay. Um, thank you, Jeroen. Um, sorry, the time is very, very limited. Um, shall we go to Fami? Fami, please. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Dina. <coughs> uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for uh, this invitation. Uh, even my time will be very short, or five minutes, to complement the presentation by Yeroen. Uh, just want to comment uh, several points. Uh, one, uh, I agree that in the past decades, uh, the union movements has enhanced uh, the union density, at least uh, the political struggle for uh, freedom of associations. Uh, so my conclusion is that the freedom of association is political uh, issue. Uh, but of course, it's it's a uh, it's political because uh, it is a struggle from from below from the workers who are fighting for for that for for that freedom, and at the same time the corporations are also trying to narrow down the political space by, uh, like uh, Yerun has mentioned, hiring the gangster thugs to intimidate the union activists. So uh, again, freedom of associations, uh, in particular in Indonesia, is uh, a, a social space where uh, the spatial arrangement shaped labor relations and also being produced by those relations. Uh, corporations also play a major role in uh, shaping the space for political freedom or uh, freedom of association of the workers uh, by way of limiting the space for the freedom of association of the workers to organize. So it's a uh, politically saturated. It's a political matter. Uh, it's not gain without a political struggle and direct actions by, by the workers. Remember uh, in the past, in 2011, 2012, uh, that, that was the time when the workers really, really uh, uh, struggle. Uh, they, for, 11 for seven months they occupied the factories that's part of the political freedom that, that's part of the freedom of association by the workers but ironically uh Yerun mentioned the union density uh i i, I quote uh, union density uh, in indonesia is quite low uh, overall it's uh, seven uh, sorry overall is uh, six percent uh, I quote uh, 
uh, ITUC data in a uh, couple of years ago. So I believe this uh, hasn't gone up uh, like uh, Jeroen mentioned 12, but of course data is different from uh, one institution to another, but it's still very, very low. But out of 6% of union density, only 5% out of it has uh, uh, collective bargaining agreements. So that's, that's also uh, barriers uh, that the union has been facing. So uh, I probably, I would better uh, update uh, about the situation uh, in a couple of days ago, uh, following the May Day rally, May Day struggle, May Day uh, movements. Police arrest more than 20 people in Jakarta uh, and 14 protesters in Sumatra, North Sumatra, because of, uh, you know, they, they are trying to articulate their political freedom. They, they are trying to uh, fight, they're trying to uh, uh, speak up against uh, injustice against uh, union busting. So union busting, ironically, uh, it's also part of uh, union's major uh, agenda in order to fight for their freedom of association. So, you know, uh, again, I would conclude with uh, reflections that uh, freedom of associations is political matter, uh, sometimes it is uh, difficult to articulate, uh, I mean, expressions, political expressions on the streets on the by street. the workers, sometimes it's uh, easy, but, but many times it's uh, also difficult, like a couple of days ago when a number of workers tried to protest uh, against the policies, against the uh, corporations who are violating labor rights. So it's uh, indeed a political uh, matter, political issue. So it is part of political struggle of, of uh, unions. Uh, I would end there, uh, hope we can discuss further later. Thank you. Um, thank you, Fami and uh, Yeroen. I, uh, we will go to our next speaker before we uh, have a discussion and maybe have some questions. And for all participants, you, you can, you can if, if there's any question, you can type down in the chat box and I will uh, deliver uh, the questions to the speakers. Okay, I'm inviting our uh, second speaker. She's Heather White. Heather White is a documentary filmmaker and also a research consultant with 20 years of experience in international advocacy on labor and human rights issues. Her documentary film, Complicit, co-directed with Lin Zhang, won nine international festival awards. Heather is the founder of Verite, a global non-profit organization monitoring factory, uh, factories in 60, 60 countries. Um, Heather will discuss the Uyghur forced labor in the electronic supply chain and beyond. And um, Heather, the time is yours. You have 15 minutes. I will let you know when the time is almost up. Okay, thank you, Dina. And thank you, Yuren and Fami, for a very interesting description of what's happening in Indonesia with respect to freedom of association. I think I'll just open my remarks by comparing the freedom of association situation just briefly in China, um, because it's an environment that's so completely different um, from what Indonesia has been experiencing because China doesn't allow any freedom of association or collective bargaining. Um, but that has not stopped global corporations from choosing to do business there for the last 25 years plus. Um, despite the fact that their codes of conduct, most of which are now based on the core conventions of the International Labor 
organization in Geneva, uh, those codes of conduct, almost all of them state that they support freedom of association, that they uh, want to work in countries and with suppliers who respect freedom of association, yet that's not the case in China. And the situation there has not um, been evolving and getting better, um, as the previous presentation pointed out, uh, but there have been uh, significant improvements over the last several years. In fact, um, China's been experiencing a major crackdown um, on labor activists, on civil society in general, on NGOs, and also on the press, which already was not free and highly censored, um, but it's actually gotten worse over the last decade. Um, there's been almost no response from the international community uh, with respect to what the impact has had um, on workers there. Uh, it's a little known fact that in fact, workers in China um, protest regularly and the government reports that there are over 30,000 labor actions annually, strikes, work slowdowns, and direct confrontation with factory management. Um, and the government often is known for underreporting uh, on situations that may cause embarrassment, but they do report that there are 30,000. So we can just imagine how many more there might actually be that go unreported officially. Um, so turning to Xinjiang, China. Oh, can we start my presentation? I was told that you guys, yeah, that you guys were going to run it um, for me. Okay, so I'm going to give a brief background uh, because I think that there are quite a few people who might not be aware of the situation of what's happening there, uh, which has been described as a forced labor situation. Um, modern slavery has been used as a designation recently. And in fact, Western governments are now speaking out about what is determined to be um, a serious situation of human rights violations taking place in Xinjiang. Uh, Xinjiang is in the northwestern uh, region of China and has been an occupied territory since 1949 uh, when the Chinese army moved in. And it's basically uh, been run by the Chinese army and the military. Uh, the, local people, the Uyghurs, who are descended uh, from the Turkish ethnic group, um, call Xinjiang East Turkestan. So if you see in any media coverage, people being interviewed, referring to East Turkestan, they're referring to Xinjiang. Uh, ethnic tensions have been uh, on the rise there, which is one of the reasons for the government crackdown, uh, which began um, more aggressively in 2009, but actually goes back to 2005 when there were a number of incidents, uh, which led the Chinese government to describe uh, an independence movement as Islamic terrorism. And because of what was happening around the world with uh, concerns around um, jihadism and uh, the rise of ISIS, uh, most governments decided that they were going to look away and not criticize China for a crackdown on what they said was an internal domestic matter um, that was connected to a wider uh, Islamic rise of extremism, which has actually um, been very unhelpful in terms of how difficult it's been for human rights advocates in China to uh, raise awareness about what's happening in Xinjiang. And it affects buyers of products from China very directly because now there's a, a situation where workers from Xinjiang have been shipped to factories around the country to work. We could go to the next slide. So there have been allegations of forced labor and genocide recently in the media that you may have um, read about. Um, there have been several documented reports by BBC, CNN, and others about the creation of internment camps 
um, for Uyghurs. There's an estimated somewhere between one and three million, which shows you how unreliable um, the reporting is in terms of the ability to actually get um, accurate numbers of how many people have been interned in these detention camps. Uh, some are putting the number at over 1 million, some are saying 2 million, and more recent um, estimates have gone as high as 3 million Uyghurs being incarcerated in detention centers. And they're also being shipped to factories to work across China. Um, there's been some estimates of over 80,000 Uyghurs being shipped to factories in central China and also on the southern coast. When I was working on my documentary, I encountered a couple of factories that reported that they had Uyghur uh, workers there. At the time, it was not a hot button issue. So people would still openly talk about it. Uh, there wasn't the type of um, pressure that there is right now from the international community, which has resulted in factories being very reluctant to talk about whether or not they have Uyghur workers. And that has an impact on the procurement process because people are not able to get very accurate or correct information when their only source of information is coming from the factories. Um, some of the more extreme allegations of what's happening in Xinjiang have extended to um, some proof that the government has been building crematoriums um, in the region, dozens of crematoriums where they've hired uh, 50 security guards or more as staff uh, there have also been um, photographs of Oregon fast lanes near some of the uh, more than 20 airports that have also been recently built in the region. So I'm not going to go into a lot of information about um, the more extreme allegations of organ harvesting of Uyghurs and some of the uh, allegations of rape and murder. But if you want me to post some links in the chat, I'd be happy to do so uh, because I have collected some of the international reporting. Uh, I think it's very credible reporting in terms of uh, the amount of research that's gone into it and the interviews uh, with credible witnesses. Um, again, because of the news blackout from the region, it's very difficult to uh, get on the ground accounts, except from people who've been escaping from China and uh, applying for refugee status in um, Tajikistan, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan. Uh, there's over 10,000 uh, Uyghurs that are currently in Turkey. Uh, they're actually at risk of deportation. Um, so it's become an issue that I think that all of us um, who are involved in the worker rights community um, should be increasingly aware of because the Chinese government has engaged in quite a bit of pushback in terms of the criticisms. Could we go to the next slide, please? Okay, so specifically for um, global firms in the electronics industry, there are credible allegations that a workforce of Uyghurs has been infiltrating factories in the electronic sector in the central and southern parts of the country, which is actually thousands of miles away from Xinjiang where they live. Um, witnesses have reported that they've been given ultimatums, that if they don't accept jobs in factories a thousand or more miles away from where they live, they will either be sent into a detention camp or uh, family land will be seized by the government. And so uh, that's one of the reasons why the forced labor designation um, has been applied to the situation. And it's also a big challenge to find out whether or not this is actually the case in any individual factory where buyers might be trying to get information about whether or not there's a workforce of Uyghurs there and under what circumstances they took their jobs um, and whether or not they're there under their um, own free will. Uh, there's a growing list of electronics companies that have been um, implicated in factories that have been known to have Uyghur workers. For example, Samsung, Apple, Amazon. There's a company called Hikvision, which has been in the media recently, which produces surveillance cameras. Um, public 
buyers hopefully will engage directly with these brands um, with respect to what's happening in their suppliers in China, uh, with respect to a Uyghur workforce. Um, there's been an effort by literally hundreds of NGOs to engage with companies that have been um, identified with Uyghur labor in their workforces. And there's been very little response from the brands. Uh, many of them have not replied uh, to letters asking um, for specific information. Uh, there's a company called Ofilm, um, which has been in the media as a major supplier of lenses for Apple, who also mentioned that um, their customers include Lenovo and Samsung, uh, Dell, HP, LG, and Huawei, which is a Chinese company. Um, but Ofilm is one of the few suppliers that's been uh, widely uh, identified with Uyghur labor just because of the challenges for journalists. Journalists, if they um, try to do the research, they're being monitored, they're being followed, they're being threatened. Um, the situation has gotten very difficult um, to try to get information out about this. But um, five suppliers of Apple have been identified and efforts by NGOs to engage with Apple on the issue have been largely unsuccessful. Uh, Apple is um, kind of the major company uh, that advocates try to engage with in terms of their China supply chain because they use China almost exclusively for production of the iPhone and the iPad, almost 100% of the production is in China, which is actually not the case for Samsung. Dell, Microsoft, and others, because as um, Urin's uh, recent um, chart showed, those uh, companies are actually spread out across Southeast Asia and have significant, significant presence in other countries in Southeast Asia, whereas Apple um, is largely the majority of their suppliers are in China. So for those thinking of engaging with brands on this issue, I think Apple stands out probably as the, um, the largest one um, to be challenging on the topic. Uh, there's been already quite a bit of advocacy on the uh, apparel sector side because apparel was initially identified as being one of the um, industries that had significant investment in Xinjiang. It's since come out that um, in the electronic sector, Xinjiang is also uh, highly um, involved in the production of uh, polysilicon, the world's largest, and also uh, solar panels. Um, but originally the pressure was on the apparel industry because there was, oh, I'm starting to hear an echo. Uh, can you still hear me okay? Yes, and yes. you have one minute left, Heather. Oh, okay. Uh, initially, the campaign started in apparel and it has moved on to electronics. So we can go to the next slide. All right, one of the challenges uh, for brands has been when they try to engage on this issue, um, if the Chinese government hears about it, um, they get targeted in the Chinese media and are uh, designated as uh, bad brands that are worthy of boycotts. There have even been celebrities, um, rock stars and uh, actors that have been hired um, to speak out against those brands on social media. H&M is one, Nike, uh, The Gap, there have been several. Um, and those campaigns you can read about online. Um, but that's having a quelling effect actually on brands that want to speak out in terms of the modern slavery and the forced labor designations. They're even removing um, the language from their websites because as the information is shared on social media across China just from their websites, then they've become the targets for criticism. Okay, we could go to the next slide. All right, so I'm uh, here basically providing some of the headlines uh, that have appeared in the global media recently. Um, but basically, the onus is upon the factories, and I hope that the buyers will be using language in their communication with the factories that they need to provide credible evidence that there is no Uyghur 
labor or forced labor in their factories, not are you using Uyghur labor in your factories, because the answer is going to be no. Nobody is going to say that they are anymore. Um, so basically, I think that the pressure needs to be on the brands in the sense of they need to provide proof and evidence that there is not forced labor, there is not modern slavery, and whether or not there is a Uyghur workforce in their factories, um, the likelihood that they will admit to it is relatively low. So the assumption should be at this point yet, that yes, there is, and what are they doing about it? Um, otherwise, there have been calls for exit, there have been calls for um, buyers to, in writing, assert that they're going to be reducing the amount of their purchases from their Chinese suppliers until they can provide credible evidence. And this has been taken up by more than 200 organizations worldwide now, as well as uh, Western governments. And I'll stop there. I can put some more information in the chat if people would like some links. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Um, that was uh, quite shocking how the situation of Uyghur um, uh, labor in, in Xinjiang. And um, we are, um, we have very limited time, so I will just uh, invite our uh, third, uh, next speaker. He is Olof Bjornsson from Sweatwatch. Olof is a human rights researcher and project manager at Sweatwatch, an NGO based in Stockholm. His research mainly relates to migrant workers' rights in the Gulf region, factory workers' exposure to hazardous chemicals in the Philippines, and corporate responsibility in conflict zones. Olaf will present uh, Sweatwatch latest research in the Philippines on how women workers in ICP supply chains are affected by the chemicals you, they used in the production. The time is yours, Olaf, and you have 15 minutes. Thank you. Can you can you hear me okay? Yes. All right. I will try to share my screen. Um, Can you see my screen now? Yes. Yes. Uh, okay, so uh, my name is uh, Ulf Bjornsson and I am a human rights researcher at uh, Swedewatch. Uh, Swedewatch is a uh, Stockholm-based NGO and we investigate how uh, human rights and the environment are affected by corporate activities. And we work across uh, all sectors and all continents, uh, basically, uh, but we specialize in particularly dangerous contexts where the risk of human rights abuse is, is higher. Uh, sorry, the research I will talk about today uh, was funded partly by the European Union through the Make ICT Fair uh, project. Uh, so this most recent research concern women uh, who are exposed to hazardous chemicals when they manufacture electronic components. Uh, I, I don't have a lot of time, as you heard, but I hope to talk both about the pretty horrible health consequences that these chemicals have on the women uh, and as well about the specific context of the Philippines. Uh, and try to explain a little bit how the issue of chemicals is related to the uh, issue of human rights. Uh, I've worked with this issue since 2019, and uh, this research has resulted in two publications. Uh, the first is a report uh, where I interviewed uh, workers in the ICT sector in the Philippines uh, about their working conditions and their health. And the second is what we call a research briefing where I asked five major tech brands uh, that source components from the Philippines what they're doing to address these issues. Uh, I will talk more about <clears throat> all this later. Just please note that these publications can be found on the Swedewatch website if you're interested or have any questions. And you can also uh, always get in touch uh, with me. Uh, first, I just wanna mention something. We've heard, we've heard about a lot of different uh, human rights aspects of electronics manufacturing. Um, in this past hour. 
uh, but I really want to talk about chemicals and ICT production. Uh, I'm not sure just how clearly it shows in the picture on the right there. Um, but if it's one thing that you should know before we, we, we start is that the ICT sector is an extremely chemical intensive sector. It's not like perhaps some say that it's a clean sector. Uh, I mean, every single item, every mobile phone, laptop or tablet is made up of hundreds, maybe thousands of components. And in every stage of their manufacture, uh, humans and the environment uh, are exposed to chemicals. And it starts with the mining of minerals and extraction of oil uh, throughout manufacturing. And even after uh, the product is used and we throw it away, uh, what we call e-waste, uh, it can continue to leak uh, chemicals uh, into the environment. Now this complex process of making a phone, uh, as we've been told uh, today, is very much a global operation where these many different components are manufactured in different parts of the world, often in countries uh, in Asia, you know, like the Philippines, Vietnam, China, and Indonesia. Um, and we've heard about uh, of course, about China and Indonesia today. Uh, I will talk about the Philippines, where I did my research. Uh, the Philippines is a country that is pretty far down in the supply chain of these products. Uh, and by that, we mean that the workers in the Philippines manufacture components that are used in other components that end up uh, in the finished product that you have in your pocket right now. Uh, they also manufacture a lot of related products like uh, chargers and headphones and uh, things that maybe doesn't require the, the same tech as, as semiconductors or, or microchips. Um, I will talk a little bit also about why the products are made in places like the Philippines. Uh, I mean, it's, it's a matter of, of cutting costs for the companies, of course. Uh, this industry has its roots in the US in Silicon Valley, in California. But as we all know, the manufacturing of these products has shifted uh, to countries with, with lower wages and also to uh, countries where the protection of workers is weaker. Uh, and this is also where workers are exposed uh, to hazardous chemicals today. Um, it's worth mentioning that workers in the US in the 80s and 90s, they also suffered uh, horrible effects of, of chemical exposure. Uh, they had the cancers and the miscarriages and uh, all the symptoms that workers in Asia are, are experiencing today. So it's pretty clear uh, when you look at it from with a bit of perspective that it's, uh, it's not just the costs and the manufacturer that's being outsourced, it's also the human rights impacts uh, in, this, uh, in this sector. Uh, to make this a bit easier to take in, I have uh, divided this presentation into two parts. First, a bit of background into the Philippines and the situation there, and then a brief um, look into my research on hazardous chemicals uh, and how, uh, how workers' health are affected by, by the chemicals. Um, to say that unions are weak in the Philippines is actually a grave understatement. Uh, unions are legal, uh, but only a few percent of the workers are actually unionized. And for five years running, uh, the International Trade Union Confederation has named the Philippines one of the worst countries in the world to be a worker. And this is mainly due to the many violent attacks against uh, union members and other activists. Uh, this is, of course, related to the general situation for human rights in the Philippines, uh, where murders of human rights defenders are quite commonplace. Uh, according to Freedom House, uh, an NGO, uh, the Philippines has the second highest number of murder human rights defenders in the world, uh, second only to Colombia, I think. Um, the situation is especially bad in the so-called economic zones, special economic zones, uh, because the zones market themselves and try to attract investors and manufacturers using uh, slogans like 
no union, no strike, no problem. Um, so what does ITUC really mean when they call the Philippines a context of extreme state violence and suppression of civil liberties? Well, it's, it's um, basically anyone who speaks up for workers' rights, be it the right to organize or bargain collectively, or even the right to, to um, have a say in occupational health and safety, are experiencing constraints or denials of their freedom of speech and assembly. Uh, intimidation and violent attacks are common, uh, as the government um, regularly label uh, unions as enemies of the state, uh, which then leads to uh, these murders or the extrajudicial killings, as they're called in the Philippines. And in the last few years, 56 union leaders and other labor rights activists have been murdered. Uh, of course, we can't go into detail uh, about all uh, of these, but uh, I will talk about one because of the relation to the, uh, to the electronics uh, sector. Uh, this is Dandy Miguel. He's only one of many murdered union leaders in the Philippines. Uh, a little more than a month ago, uh, he was shot eight times as he was on his way home on his motorcycle. Um, I, I only met, met him briefly actually in the Philippines, but I know that he was working to improve the working conditions in a factory that makes components for some of the world's biggest uh, ICT brands. Uh, these are companies that manufacture products that you most likely use every day in your home or, or at work. So I hope the stage is set at this point regarding workers' rights in the, in the Philippines. Uh, I mean, you, you cannot bring up, bring up issues of unionization, collective bargaining, and occupational health and safety if you're constantly being afraid of being murdered. Uh, so what about the actual working conditions uh, uh, in the electronic sector in the Philippines? Um, in my work, I joined forces with a local partner organization, CTUHR, and we interviewed uh, people working uh, in the industry. Oh, I cannot. Sorry. Yep. Uh, you have five minutes left. Yep. Um, I can't really go into details because uh, <laughs> I don't have the time, but I will give you a brief snapshot of the situation before I have to round off. Uh, the women. Uh, I interviewed because they're mostly women, work 12 hour shifts, six days a week, uh, manufacturing components and products for uh, some of the world's major uh, ICT brands. Uh, they were exposed to many hazardous chemicals without training and proper information, without the ventilation and without protective equipment. Uh, they say that talking about the chemicals uh, with their manager is not possible. And anyone who raised the question of worker safety uh, risks losing their job. Uh, all interviewees stated that their factories, in their factories, workers are exposed to DCM, toluene, and lead. Uh, I don't expect you to know in detail uh, about these substances, uh, but to suffice to say, there are three very hazardous substances, uh, and you can learn more about them if you look. Uh, into my research. Um, workers said that they experienced dizziness, headaches, chest pains, muscle spasms, and a compromised immune system. Um, these women suffer from irregular periods, myoma, and difficulties conceiving. Uh, they are experiencing miscarriages and stillbirths. Uh, they also suffer from frequent cancers. Uh, mainly breast cancer and ovarian cancer, uh, but also talk about thyroid cancer and leukemia. And before I round off, I just want to give you some idea of the stories I was told uh, by these uh, workers. Uh, these, are, uh, these are their uh, words. 
if we want to know whether the chemicals are dangerous, the manager asks us if we want the job or not. They say that we applied for the job and should not be complaining. I'm the fourth woman in our production line to get cancer. I got breast cancer and the others got ovarian cancer. There was another woman who died, but I'm not sure if it was cancer or not. We had a colleague who died of thyroid cancer. She worked the night shift at the soldiering station for seven years, and then she died at the age of 26. You will sometimes see female workers fainting or silently crying while at work. We were giving a safe and safety orientation, but no one told us about the risks. We were told how to perform the task, but the chemicals and their effect on the body, that was not included in the orientation. I have had several miscarriages. I never got cancer, but several of my co coworkers got ovarian cancer or breast cancer. I had two miscarriages, and I know of another worker who had one. She eventually needed surgery to her ovaries. We have to endure in silence. We have to endure the pain every day because we need the job. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Olaf, and thank you all of the speakers for the uh, very um, interesting um, presentations and um, especially for the last one, how we learned that uh, those workers that make our um, electronic products have faced so many um, things and they affected by all the chemicals that they uh, use at production of um, the things that they produce for the um, for the electric uh, the electronic products that we use and we bought so um, we have uh, 10 minutes for questions if should there be any question I have I received one but actually Heather already uh, answered the question but nevertheless um, I will just read the questions um, what does um, airport with organ fastlings refer to? Does it refer to human organs trafficking? And would, uh, would you, Heather, would you please uh, answer that? Um, I know you already wrote in the chat box, but could you please say more about that? Uh, yes, can you hear me okay? Yes, perfectly. Oh, okay. Um, well, my answer basically uh, refers to the fact that China has the largest organ transplant industry in the world, and that has been um, called into question in recent years. The, there have been uh, many hearings that have been held about it uh, because physicians are concerned about how easy it is to get an organ um, if you go to China. Uh, there's something that's been called uh, transplant tourism um, that is started appearing um, covered by the media about tourists arriving from abroad and being able uh, to obtain at short order uh, livers kidneys eyes i mean things that normally in other countries people are having to wait years to obtain if ever because of the long waiting lists um, but uh, china is able to supply them these are state run hospitals it's not a, a black market situation where people are going below the radar uh, but they're actually working with government run hospitals. There have been some escaped um, doctors who've uh, given interviews. You can read about um, some of the uh, stories that they tell on YouTube. There's been uh, quite a, a bit of interesting reporting about it uh, from credible sources. And um, the allegations are that um, Uyghurs are being used in these uh, forced organ harvesting surgeries, which is why uh, some critics are saying they've built so many new airports, uh, why there are crematoriums that are being built um, very close to these uh, airports and detention centers and the organ fast lanes are to be able to get organs um, onto airplanes and shipped around the country where these various hospitals are. It's a you know really horrifying um, possibility, but I think it's really important for people to be aware of what's happening because the term genocide is now being used. And um, it's, you know, really important for us as consumers not to be financing it because we're buying products that are being sold to us um, by these factories that 
global brands are continuing to produce. They're not answering questions about it. And we as consumers need a lot more information. And there's now a call for boycotts by um, a number of organizations. Okay, um, thank you, Heather. And um, let's make uh, I'm not, I make note that we about the the campaign and also the boycott for the for the products. And and um, there's no more question. Oh, there's. Oh, it's it's all of uh, send the link for the report on hazardous chemicals in the chat box. Anybody who uh, are interested in reading the report could go to the link. And I have a question for um, uh, Yeroon and also also Fami, as I'm also based in Indonesia. But I have a bit a general uh, question in this under this COVID nineteen pandemic and. This would pose more barrier, I think, uh, to the to the freedom of association. As Fami just said that uh, last um, May Day in Jakarta, without under the under the charge of breaching the no gathering rules um, of, in Indonesia in Jakarta, there were uh, the the mass and the protesters, the demonstrators were not allowed to, which is arrested. And then um, that's one of the one of the pretexts of the the worsening of freedom of association under this COVID nineteen. What what can you say about this? And uh, what are the possibilities, or maybe what are the chances for the labor movement and also CSO to further and to uh, come up with a with the new strategy of organizing as the um, under this COVID nineteen with the current situation. Iron, you can you you want to start? Um, yeah. Now I'm 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 I must say I'm not very aware of of the the latest developments. So there, Fami could probably uh, say more. Um, I think we we did ask a few questions in the survey on on the impact of COVID nineteen, um, but we could not necessarily find a way that it was impacting trade union rights at that point of time, right? Which is a half year ago. But we had more questions about health and safety measures and the role of the union in that. And of course, I think, and again, my, my data is not up to date, but a half year ago, at the beginning of the, there was, an, there was a fear that there would become a great recession economic recession um, and that the electronics industry and the interruption of supply chains would cause uh, many factories to clo close down. I think by now, I think most people would say that the electronics industry has benefited in general of a, of a, a rise in demand. So, I, so I'm not sure to what extent it has an impact on, 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 on employment and because what we found in the survey is that that over time had decreased, right? So, so, so it had an impact on income uh, because the, 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 the number, the hours of overtime uh, were, were less than before the crisis. But probably that is already being, that's no longer the case. Of course, I, I, what I said, I, maybe Fami could say more about the Indonesian context today. But of course, we see in many countries, many countries, we, a misuse of COVID-19 measures to repress trade unions to, and to stop uh, organizers and, and to stop demonstrations. So it's a, it's, it's a general trend, uh, especially in India, we have seen this, but also in other countries. Uh, but again, I, I, I don't know, um, but Fami could probably go, come in now and, and say something about the current situation in Indonesia. Yeah. Uh, the workers in general, including in, in electronics, try to uh, express their aspirations, political aspirations uh, on the street again, because they, they, they are missing 
the 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 strip as a real political uh, ground for expressing uh, the aspirations. Uh, certainly, uh, during the COVID pandemic, uh, majority of the workers and the unions have been uh, using online platform for their uh, education, for their meetings, for their uh, gathering uh, on union matters. But uh, May Day is uh, very, very special. Uh, May Day or Labor Day in Indonesia is just, you know, recognized as a public holiday, recognized as International Labor Day. Just in 2012, if I'm not mistaken, uh of course because we have been demanding the government to make it public holiday to make it a, to make it to to, to recognize uh, the, the the significance of uh, labor day so that's a political struggle by the workers so may day is important and uh and on 2nd may it's also education day. It's a commemoration of education day. So the workers were collaborating with the students and workers and students on 2nd May, they gather and they demand political change. They demand uh, justice uh, to the government and in the afternoon of the 2nd May, they, they were arrested and uh, many in many places it was violence by the police and uh, of course using uh, the reasons that it's uh, COVID uh, prevention measures. But the, the workers have the arguments. They, yes. they follow the health protocol, they, they follow uh, the health protocol so that they are still legal to express their political aspirations. There's, they, they use masks and keep this distance, uh, physical distancing and so forth. And uh, this is to, you know, to show the, to the government, to the public that uh, we are not uh, violating any rules, but Certainly, this is not easy to convince uh, the states and the governments. And of course, during uh, this is also special because this is the in Indonesia is a Muslim majority Muslim people uh, approaching in celebrating Idul Fitri and many uh, unions and many workers they are not receiving. Uh, annual bonus, which is as, as stipulated by the, the law. So this is part of the, the, the struggle that workers are trying to, to demand the governments to fulfill. So, so basically, uh, this is a difficult, uh, I get, again, this is political issue. Uh, last points I, I want to say is uh, that freedom of, of association is somehow useless because since the number of informal or irregular or outsourced or daily workers are increasing and they are discouraged to join the, the union. So this is also another challenge and another barrier for us to, to, to fight for. Thank you. Um, thank you for me. And that your last statement would also be very make difficult for workers to voice and to speak about the chemicals and also the impact of chemicals that they having in their body, including for what happened, including what uh, all of uh, just said and presented in, in the Philippines. I think that's also uh, very similar what happened in the Philippines, also in Indonesia and other production countries. And uh, with that, I'm closing this session. I uh, would like to say thank you so much to Yerun, Fami, Heather, and also all of the presentations. And um, uh, with this, I close the session. Thank you so much. Have a good day.
and go back to uh, Geor Georgina. Yeah, Georgina. Thank you. Georgina, thank you, Dina. <laughs> I want to thank you all the participants for this uh, last panel. You're in Mark, Fagmi, Pinebach, Heather White, Olaf Björsson, and of course, uh, Dina Septi from Indonesia. Bé, doncs, posem punt i final a aquesta taula d'avui, eh, certament molt impactant, amb tots els testimonis que ens han acompanyat durant aquesta última hora. I també, eh, fent un seguiment a aquesta última taula, saludar els alumnes i professors del Centre de Formació d'Adults Rius i Taulet de l'Institut Lluís Vives i de l'Institut La Guinaueta, que ens estan seguint, com dèiem, a aquesta última taula d'avui. I a aquesta hora hem arribat ja a la cluenda d'aquesta primera jornada. Moltes gràcies a totes i a tots. Abans d'acabar, sí que vull agrair a Setem i a tot l'equip, que això sí que no ho he dit a l'inici, per haver comptat i confiat en mi per aquesta primera jornada. Esperem que us hagi agradat. Ha estat molt intensa, molt enriquidora. I recordeu que demà seguim, ens tornem a trobar en aquesta sala virtual a tres quarts de deu. L'encarregada de conduir l'acte demà serà la periodista Marta Molina. La segona jornada tractarà de la contínua cadena de producció, ús i consum dels nostres aparells electrònics i on van a parar un cop prescindim d'ells. També es parlarà de les alternatives i es presentaran algunes iniciatives locals, no us ho perdeu, i tingueu en compte que la connexió serà des d'un altre enllaç diferent al que fins ara havíem utilitzat d'aquest primer dia i us el vam facilitar per correu electrònic. Si teniu qualsevol dubte també sabeu que podeu contactar amb Setem. Moltíssimes gràcies i posem punt i final a aquesta primera jornada.